Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagan Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the To the Future Space Experience by Boeing and Axios, uh, the company's uh, center here to uh, for about the next month, uh, if I'm right, uh, to show uh, a Washington audience a little bit about what the company does in space. And we're honored to have with us Tony Castilleja. Uh, we had an opportunity. Uh, you're a systems engineer uh, with Boeing Missiles, or I should say Space and uh, Missiles, and we had an opportunity to talk about the Starliner in uh, Dubai, uh, which was a great interview. So I said, suggest folks uh, go and, uh, and and check that out. And Josh Barrett, who's a communications specialist, uh, also in the business. And uh, your forte is the spacesuit, among other uh, things, uh, down there. Starliner as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Star, Starliner uh, as, a, as a whole. So I'm, I'm glad that I've got both of you, because I want to ask you about the SLS, the Starliner, and also about uh, the, the spacesuit. So Tony, let's start out with you. Um, talk to us a little bit about why this uh, center is so important, right? I mean, it's a, it's a nice piece of investment on your guys' part, whether you're bringing the simulators in or some of the other displays. Why is it so important? to have this center set up here in downtown Washington, D.C.? Well, it's a great partnership with Axios and Boeing. The future of space is being built right now, and to be able to showcase that here in Washington, D.C., with a lot of the individuals that helped define the opportunity of human space flight. Well, we brought the Starliner Simulator. We're bringing the space launch system, and we're giving people an experience so that they can feel the power and the ingenuity of our engineers who are working every day to deliver on a bold space program that NASA is at the forefront of, and Boeing is very proud to support every single step of the way. Uh, and Josh, from your standpoint as a communicator, you know, one, one of the two are an engineer, but from a communication standpoint, why is this so important? Well, so 2019 is a huge year. Historically, it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo, landing, Apollo 11 lunar landing. And then this year, we're going to be flying crew from the Kennedy Space Center, first time since the space shuttle on the Starliner. So it was just important to come to the nation's capital and say, you know, the space program is alive um, and get excited for what's coming. Um, and, and let's uh, talk a little bit about that. I mean, without rockets, you don't go anywhere. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I remember one of my earliest memories was Apollo 8. So uh, spending uh, Christmas uh, was great with some of the folks. I mean, I, I think there should have been a more, a bigger recognition uh, of what that mission with Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and uh, Bill Anders uh, was was like in terms of the first deep space mission and a mission that was supposed to be an Earth orbit mission, not a lunar mission, uh, obviously, and where the moonrise photograph came, uh, which I think was one of the seminal moments and one of the greatest photographs in human history, but I digress. So Tony, bring us up to speed on the space launch system, where we are on that. Uh, obviously, Boeing is the core of that as well as the uh, upper stage. Um, talk to us a little bit about where you are on the development of the spacecraft, because that is uh, both for Earth orbit applications, but also interplanetary application, which is what uh, the spacecraft is, uh, what, what the rocket system is being designed for. Right. The space launch system solves a rocket equation to launch the gateway and a robust human space exploration effort into deep space. And right now we're in the throes of continuing to manufacture and deliver the core stage components, which include um, from the engine structure all the way up to the mating adapter with the Orion spacecraft, including the exploration upper stage and the tanks themselves. And just, you know, this past week, we've showcased how the structural test article was installed at Huntsville, Alabama's Marshall Space Flight Center to conduct all the stress and analysis and testing of the forces of flight there on the ground. And it's truly remarkable to see the size and power of that vehicle as it got installed uh, there on the Huntsville skyline. It's a big rocket, and I think people are truly realizing the value of that rocket as it continues to go through its stress testing program. And uh, talk to us a little bit about the dimensions of the rocket and its capabilities. Obviously, it's flexible. It's got a liquid core, but it also has strap-on boosters. Um, and I think it's also deceptive how big it is because the Apollo tapers down to a much smaller capsule. That taper is to a much, much larger uh, spacecraft. And I want to ask you, Josh, about the Starliner in a moment right. to give us an update. Date. But talk to us a little bit about the size and the capabilities of that launch vehicle. That's right, Space Launch System, 8.5 meter diameter rocket uh, with two solid rocket boosters, one extra segment on each one of those boosters uh, necessary for the types of payloads that we're going to be launching into deep space. It will be able to provide more than 26 metric tons to the lunar surface. It, and its evolvable capability take up to 45 metric tons uh, to deep space. And that's the kind of rocket and power you need to be able to launch payloads including Orion, as well as other payloads for the gateway architecture and beyond. And so that power uh, is becoming realized with our designs going through that stress testing and going into first flight into the 2020 timeframe uncrewed and then crewed uh, soon afterward. 
And uh, Josh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the spacecraft, the Starliner, Chris Ferguson, uh, who we had an opportunity to talk with at the Paris Air Show. Uh, the last Paris Air Show, uh, he was uh, sequestered, I think, uh, the last time around because he uh, falls into the rare category of somebody who's engineering a spacecraft they're eventually going to fly. So that's in Gus Grissom uh, territory, uh, actually. Uh, tell us a little bit about where we are on uh, the spacecraft development uh, and a little bit about, the, about, you know, for the audience, you know, a little bit of an update on the capabilities that the spacecraft is going to be uh, bringing, which is uh, going to be unique in many respects. So I'll start with your second question first. What's exciting about this program, a lot of the programs you see around around here with SLS and Gateway and ISS, traditionally a company like Boeing builds those vehicles, gives it to NASA, and then NASA operates it. But with Starliner, uh, Boeing is building the vehicle. We will own and operate the vehicle. And so the idea is we're selling a service to NASA it's a little more cost effective, um, and then we can also sell that service to other customers and open up low Earth orbit. So that's really what Starliner is all about, getting commercial industry into low Earth orbit as NASA focuses on deep space. Um, and, and a reusable um, um, uh, terrestrial landing, Earth landing, hard landing, not water landing, uh, right? It looks a lot like an Apollo spacecraft, but it won't be landing in the water. Exactly. You know, a lot of people will say we look like Apollo, um, but, you know, 50 years ago, the shape of the capsule, they got that down. If you look at an airplane, that shape hasn't changed too much either, but what matters is what's inside. So we put some airbags in there to make it able to land on land. Um, you know, all the flight computers and everything inside the vehicle is state of the art. It's a true 21st century space capsule. Um, and we're excited to see it fly. 2019 has started off really strong. Uh, we just wrapped up our own structural testing campaign and that's, Tony was talking about that, where you take the structures of the vehicle, put them through its paces, you know, take it up to 150 plus percent, the forces it'll see on launch and landing. Um, we're in environmental testing right now, so that includes acoustic testing. You put it in a big sound chamber and just shake up the vehicle like it'll see on top of the rocket. That's act actually finished. Um, we're doing thermal vacuum testing, which uh, is like it says, you expose it to the heat and cold of space, vacuum of space, and then we will do electromagnetic radiation testing. And um, between that, and our parachute testing and hot fire testing, those are our last major campaigns, and then we're about ready to fly. And uh, give us a sense on where, uh, when roughly, you know, the time frame you're shooting at for hot fire test, uh, and and the first time that the spacecraft uh, hopefully is going to fly. So all of this is going to happen in the spring. Right now we're tar targeting the March for the uncrewed test flight, March April for the hot fire test of those launch abort engines, um, and then the crewed test flight we're looking at August for that. And you think you're going to nail it? We hope. <laughs> well, I think everybody will keep their fingers uh, crossed, and uh, it would be great to be down there to to to, to see uh, uh, always a new spacecraft uh, going uh, going into orbit. Um, so let me ask you guys about the space suit. So which one of you guys wants to take the space suit question? Do you want to take the space? Well, let me let me ask you. Actually, let me ask you about the Starliner, Tony. Right. The the training system. You guys have uh, a cockpit uh, simulator, uh, if you will, a docking simulator. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the one that you have here differs from the one that astronauts are going to be using because there's releasability issues and challenges. You know, even though this is a commercial setup, uh, there are things that, uh, you know, the regular civilian can see and can't see and can use and can't use. But talk to us a little bit about how you guys are, are using technology in a very, very different way to enable um, both automatic docking, but also a very, very different kind of assisted docking than what folks have had, for example, on the space shuttle uh, or, or even what they have on most modes, for example, even on the Soyuz spacecraft. Right, so the Boeing uh, Starliner is an autonomous vehicle. It flies itself and it really leverages the best of Boeing in terms of the flight computers uh, from even the X-37 to uh, the heritage technology of our engineers and scientists from the space shuttle program. LiDAR technologies uh, that allow for the vehicle to identify the shapes for docking um, which help for that nominal approach in a pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time. What we train for is for the scenario where the human does have to take charge, and we're doing that right now at Building 5 and at Building 9 at NASA's Johnson Space Center, the home of astronaut training. We have a full-scale trainer, which would be a typical uh, pad ops uh, trainer through docking with cargo all around you, your full crew element to get familiarized with our astronaut crews, our assigned NASA astronaut crews, as well as Boeing astronaut Chris Ferguson. And then we have the simulator here, which is uh, pretty much a uh, one-for-one with what we would call a part task trainer. So the console that you see here in Washington DC is exactly the size and shape and the number of switches uh, with just the elements of uh, commercial and ex external type events but other than that the 
trainer and the actual simulation is exactly like what our astronauts are going through every single day right now in Johnson. Um, I'm, I am still uh, not convinced because I, I think I was off enough on that bullseye that it was positively terrifying bringing it in. Bringing it in. But I'm going to take your word for it that it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty close. Um, I, one of the things, Josh, I didn't ask you about is uh, the capabilities of the spacecraft uh, itself because it, it's a lot larger. Um, talk to us about what uh, mission duration, durability is, and also payload capacity uh, is like on the spaceship. So it just depends. It's uh, um the interior is modular, so you can put seats, you can put cargo pallets in. It depends, you know, for these first missions, what NASA wants. Uh, nominally, we're going to have four NASA and international partner astronauts. Uh, we have another seat available for purchase, and then we also have a couple hundred pounds of cargo that we can take up for NASA, which are powered payloads. Those are kind of the hot commodity because they need electricity to stay cool or hot or, you know, preserve the scientific results. So we'll be bringing those up and down um, on the International Space Station. Uh, nominally, to get to the space station, anywhere from six hours to 24 hours, just depends where the station's at in its orbit. And then um, once you undock from the space station, it's just a couple hour trip back down. Right. Well, coming back down, right, it's not the tyranny of orbital mechanics, uh, which is trying to catch up to the thing uh, when it's orbiting. Let me ask you one upper stage question before I get to the, uh, the spacesuit. Uh, upper stage, you guys pride yourself on a very, very powerful upper stage in order to be able to get to the moon and, and beyond. Uh, everybody always fo focuses on the core and on the lower stage. Talk to us a little bit about the upper stage propulsion unit. Yeah, so the exploration upper stage is truly the deep space uh, enabler, and Boeing has been working traditionally with NASA to look at the full trade space of maximizing that upper stage capability. So from uh, technologies, not only from a baseline of the metallic tanks, but opportunities for the future, and then looking at what we need to do to uh, enable the specific architectures that NASA is looking at. We're continuing to move forward uh, in terms of looking that full opportunity led for by NASA. And uh, on the spacesuit, uh, Josh. Uh, so you, you know, you got Reebok shoes. So that's uh, uh, yeah, which is sort of an odd takeaway from it. I, I, I think I think the Clark, the the coolness of the suit. And frankly, you know, you were saying about nailing it right. In many respects, that looks like a design that we would have seen in the 1950s as we were going through the uh, spacesuit development. But bring us up to speed on the suit development, where we are on it, what makes it different from other suits, uh, you know, or in in some respects, what makes it uh, the same. But what are the key kind of attributes you guys are shooting? shooting at uh, with this new suit. So, like you said, you want to have the cool factor, but you also don't want to sacrifice the suit doing what it's intended to do, and that's keep astronauts alive in the Starliner if something goes wrong. That's their first line of defense. Um, so it's optimized to be uh, in use in the interior of the Starliner during ascent and landing. And actually, the astronauts can get out of the suit in orbit, and it's designed to be able to be put back on quick enough if there is an emergency and they need to get back in their suits. But there's a lot of features that we've added for both comfort and safety. Um, you know, one thing Chris Ferguson will tell a story about how when he landed the space shuttle, the first thing he wanted to do was take off his big heavy helmet after he'd been through that high G reentry, uh, but there was nowhere to put the helmet. So we put um, the padding on a cap that the astronauts will, we will wear, and then the soft shell hood comes over and seals the suit itself. So that's one innovation. Um, there's touchscreen capable gloves. The joints are designed to, to be flexible even when the suit is pressurized. Um, it's actually breathable too while staying pressurized. So uh, there's a lot of kind of new innovations, just taking what, what worked from the shuttle program, um, making it look cooler and also making it work a little better. And, uh, but it is reminiscent of the Gemini suit that Frank Borman uh, and Jim Lovell wore, right, for their two-week uh, space mission where they had a hood. They didn't have a hard helmet uh, on it. A uh, little bit of shout-out to two extraordinary uh, uh, extraordinary and legendary astronauts. Tony Castilla, uh, who is the systems engineer with uh, Boeing Space uh, and Missiles, and uh, Josh Barrett, uh, also from the same organization. Guys, thanks very, very much. Really appreciate it. Best of luck on the program. And uh, can't, can't wait to come down and visit you guys uh, down in sunny Florida, especially when it's only, it's only like, you know, mid, you know, 18 degrees or so outside. Guys, thanks very much. No worries. We'll uh, see you at the launch pad uh, on a warmer day. It'll be warmer because of our rockets flying. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Vago. And I'm based in Florida, so I am frozen up here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do they even have coats down there? Not, not really. No, just kidding, guys. Thanks very much. Best of luck. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Vago.